Greetings, my friends, and Merry Christmas. I know there are some of you that probably uh, would take issue with that and uh, want to talk about the pagan roots, but you know, my heart goes out to families during this time of year, certainly with all that we've been through and are going through now. It's going to be a, a little different Christmas than usual. And one of the things I want to do this morning is, even though we're going to look at a couple verses from uh, the words of comfort that we always read during this time of year, but I want to view Christmas a little differently. I want to kind of take you on a journey and see Christmas, the first Christmas, through the eyes of Joseph. And I think before we're through today, you'll find that this is not just going to be another uh, manger scene and uh, talk about the things that most of us already know about and thank God for, and that around the world in some form, thank God in spite of all the commercialism and things that take place during a holiday season, I'm just thankful that there is an opportunity uh, to remember there was a baby born in Bethlehem and the angels announced that this was a savior. Unto us a child was born, a king was given, a king of kings and lord of lords. So if you have a Bible today, I want you to join me in the Gospel of Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament. We're going to begin in chapter 1. I want to read just a couple of verses, and then we're going to kind of look at Christmas a little differently, through the eyes of Joseph. So in Matthew chapter 1, beginning of verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, that when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, remember that, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, he was minded to put her away privily or privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that regardless of what man does and traditions do, that Father, we take opportunity during this time of year, in spite of all that we're going through, and we ask, Father God, for those families especially today that perhaps have lost a loved one, there's someone missing during this time of the year when families come together. Many that will not because of COVID-19, because of restrictions. But Father, I'm so thankful that we can invite you into our home, that you come and you've said, Father, that you will be where there's even two or three gathered together. And Father, as we gather together, even through this video, I pray, Father, your blessing on all who listen with their hearts. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I've already heard from a few people. I, I did a wedding renewal ceremony last night and talking with a few folks about how that this year it's just not like Christmas. And certainly understandable when in fact we have families that uh, are not going to be able to come together. Uh, Missing family members, sadly, that have uh, gone on to be with the Lord during this time. Family separated for many issues. And oftentimes I think we let the world define to us what uh, having a good Christmas, if you will, is. Just like too often we let the world define too much of what we do in life. And so again, I want to take the story, uh, the story of Christmas, and see it through the eyes 
of Joseph in the first Christmas. If you were uh, with us last Wednesday night, I began talking about it was the title of the message, A People of Purpose. And that's been heavy on my heart to the point that uh, it will be encased in Christmas historical value. But the Lord's given me kind of a three-part message. Please don't miss next Wednesday night because there's a prophetic message, a promise to uh, parents and grandparents that God's going to bring your children home. And by home, I don't mean just in your house. They may already be there, but you want them home. You want them home serving God. But I talked about a people of purpose because the time that we're in right now, there's never been a more important time than we each individually know what our purpose is and seek to fulfill it. We're living in one of the most critical times in all of earth's history. And yet I remind you, it's during this time, in spite of its difficulty, that the Bible says the prophets, they saw our day. Prophetically, they could see into the future. They knew the scriptures. And they knew there was coming in what was called the last days or the day of the Lord. That Yes, judgment. Yes, a final wrap-up of time and all that man has done and built. But it's also a time of great revival. And I'll be sharing more about that Wednesday night. I talked about it last Wednesday night. And how important it is that during a time where the things of God are mocked, God's people are hated, God's word is uh, dismissed entirely. That we know what our purpose is for being here at this special time in earth's history. So I'm going to talk about the kind of people God's looking for. The call on their life to be a witness and a testimony during this difficult time. And yet this critical this critical time where God has promised that he's going to move one last time and that even when darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people, let me say it this way, no matter who's in the White House, no matter who controls the Senate and the Congress, yes, I continue to believe with you for what would be the righteous, if not even the most common sense choice for president. And yet I would also say unto you, that no matter who sits in the White House, I know who sits on the throne. Amen. So let's talk about Joseph. Here we have the story of how that uh, he's espoused to Mary, which was a one-year period when, in fact, a man and woman who were arranged to be married, there was a contractual uh, meeting that took place between the fathers of both uh, the husband and wife-to-be, there was a dowry exchange, the father of the husband to the father of the daughter. And also during this time, the, year for, the reason for the one year was so that there could be full examination of the rightness, if you will, of them eventually being joined together. You notice we read that Joseph finds out that Mary's pregnant and they had yet, King James, come together. That means... Their marriage had not been consummated, even though in biblical times, the espousal period was just as binding as the marriage after the honeymoon night. So you say, well, why would they wait a year before they come together? Because if in fact the woman had been unfaithful, she would be seen to be pregnant, so it covered the nine months. And then the man had the opportunity to make a decision. Is this the woman that I want to spend the rest of my life with? Now, don't want to get into the unfairness, although it's there, as to why uh, the man wasn't equally examined. But there's a picture here and a point that I don't want us to miss. Because again, we're looking at that first Christmas through the eyes of Joseph. And the kind of people that God's looking for that understand their purpose. And so first of all, let's talk about who, what we know about Joseph. What do we know? Well, if you go to Luke chapter 2, among other things, we're told that Joseph was a carpenter. If you're taking notes, it's a good time to start. 
Now, that's a little misleading to just say he was a carpenter. The Greek word there is texton, T-E-X-T-O-N. And what it means is more than a carpenter, someone with saws and hammers working with wood. Actually, it was, and this is not to in any way dismiss the importance of carpenters, but actually this term texton would be where we get our word architect. Or in other words, Joseph was more than just a carpenter, which would have been an important trade in those days, but not one that would have had much gain and uh, remuneration. He would have not made that much money. But it's interesting that word texton means that Joseph was an architect. A little research and you'll find out that the town that he uh, is living in and works from is Nazareth. And outside of, to this day, outside of Nazareth is one of the largest stone quarries in all of Israel. And more than likely, as a lot of the inhabitants of Nazareth, there were these highly educated, very intelligent, well-paid textons. They worked with stone, not with wood. They would have had the skills that enabled them to build arches with the keystone that held it together. They were very, very educated, skilled, and well-paid. So let's begin to change our image right from the beginning so that we don't see a lowly carpenter just barely getting by on minimum wage. Yes, in fact, Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, would have been very wealthy. Now, that's going to be important in a minute when we move on looking at Christmas through the eyes of Jesus. So not only was he a carpenter, but what we just read had to be some of the most shocking news that any man could ever receive. That a woman he's a few months away from committing his life completely to, espoused or engaged now in a commitment that's going to take uh, priests involved to uh, allow a bill of divorce to be written. And he finds out that Mary's pregnant. Now, I know for us, that's a beautiful manger story and the story of the birth of Jesus, but let's get real and kind of go back and look through the eyes of Joseph and realize that when he got this news, can you imagine that moment? I don't know when uh, Mary would have found the opportunity, but I'm sure she uh, had a little trepidation to say the least. And there had to come that night, maybe it was after a dinner together and hopefully sitting by a warm fire. And Mary said, Joseph, I, I have something I need to talk to you about. How in the world, even with the best of skills, you could explain to your husband-to-be, I am pregnant. I'm pregnant, but uh, as you know, it's not your baby. And believe this or not, I have been with no man. Now, I can think of a lot of excuses, but that would normally be a good uh, idea to come up with. You're pregnant. She, he can see that you're showing. He knows you're pregnant. You know you're pregnant. And yet you're going to tell him, listen, we read it. This is the Holy Ghost. I have been made with child, not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit. Wow. So here we have Joseph now that has to deal with that. And I love what it says. It said he didn't want to uh, make a public spectacle of her. During the culture of that day, had this happened in reality to where an espoused wife uh, was found to have been with another man during that time, they not only would have not got married, but they would have been, uh, to say the least, looked down upon by society in general. And more importantly, think about this. Families. You ever thought about that? Especially during this time of year where if you do get together with family, there's always some of those issues with in-laws that makes it almost a time that you want to kind of get through than, rather than look forward to. Well, they had the same problem. During this holiday season for them, the word has gotten out. Mary's pregnant. Everybody could see that. And they're trying to explain to the family what Joseph's having a hard enough time understanding and accepting. Yes, I know she's pregnant, but uh, she's been faithful to me. This is something I've never seen happen before, and I can't tell you completely that I understand it, 
But then God gives, and we read this, God gives Joseph a dream. And in the dream, the angel of the Lord says to him, Joseph, don't fear taking Mary to be your wife because that thing which is in her or the reason she's pregnant is because God is doing something he's never done before and will never do again. But the Son of God, a Savior, he said, named Jesus, has been conceived in her by the Holy Ghost. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down a couple things we've learned now so far about Joseph. Number one, and again, this is going to become more important in a minute, he was not a, uh, just a blue-collar worker. He would have been a well-paid, very intelligent architect, skilled perhaps in stonework. They didn't build a lot of houses out of wood back in those days. Wealthy man who now has proven that he can be a man of purpose. You say, now listen carefully. He's just, he's just an architect. He's not a pastor. He's not an evangelist. He's not a prophet or a teacher. He's a man with a skill. And you know, there are too many people today talking about finding your purpose. There are too many people today that have sadly allowed their life to be separated or a dichotomy between what they would call their spiritual life or their, their call, their ministry, their gifts. And then they would have, which is usually the larger part, of course, their secular life. And yet, I believe it's time that we awaken to the truth that Paul taught in Ephesians. That truly the fivefold ministry is only those who are called to prepare others to go do the ministry. And yet because in our mindset we've been taught and think of ministry as being a pulpit call, uh, someone who uh, is full-time as a pastor, maybe travels as an evangelist. And most would say, but that's, I've been through all five, Brother Wes, and none of those are what I'm called to do. Well, I want to show you something tonight that I think can be of tremendous value to the kingdom of God. And that is if we have our eyes opened, that whatever it is that God's called you to do in life, your purpose, whether it's an architect, a plumber, a doctor, a nurse, or perhaps the highest calling on the planet and one of the most difficult and the most underpaid, a mother, a grandmother, certainly a father in an hour where we have families falling apart. That is your purpose. Let me tell you a little story. I heard John Bevere, one of my favorite uh, ministers, I've read all of his books more than once, Bait of Satan, he's written one of the best books on the fear of God. Highly recommend John Bevere. And he tells the story of a, a man that was in one of his churches at one time. He said he was a wealthy man. He was a professional, I want to say a lawyer. And he was a faithful member in John's church. And John recalls the time that he said, I saw him on uh, one of our Sunday nights when we feed the homeless, uh, whatever night it was, whatever the case may be, there was a homeless uh, ministry that his church had. And he saw this brother involved in it and he thought, wow, this man is so busy. Uh, he's got a lot on his plate and, uh, you know, it's great that he's willing to come help us, but I just want to let him know that uh, that may not be necessary for him to do. Uh, we appreciate uh, other contributions you make, just having you as part of our congregation. But I want you to listen to the man's answer. He said, Pastor, and, and it, with what seemed to be uh, almost a desperate look in his face, he said, Pastor, oh, please, please don't ask me to step down from serving food to the poor. He said, do you realize that that's the only one day of the week? Listen to this now. He said, Pastor, it's the only one day of the week when I get to serve God. And he said, and I love it. I know what God said in Matthew uh, 25, that uh, if we're to feed the hungry and clothe the homeless. And he said, and, and that's one of my favorite times. Because, here's his words again, it's the only time I get to serve God. Now, wherever this intelligent man got that idea, it's certainly not from the Bible. 
Because God has given the fivefold ministry to a very small percentage of people, and their call is, according to Ephesians, equip the rest of the born again believers to go do the work of the ministry. Not just preach, not sing and prophesy only, but whatever God has skilled you with, that's His gift. And you use it to and for the glory of God. If you're a nurse, as I heard Brother Francisco tell me the other day when we talked, he said there were many nurses, all of them touched and moved by what they saw God do in his life while he was hospitalized with uh, COVID-19. But then he will talk about the, I think it was two in particular that knew the Lord and were totally fearless coming into the COVID-19 ward and went far beyond the normal requirements and responsibilities of a nurse and uh, was at some point, pretty obvious that she knew the Lord. But more importantly than just knowing the Lord, she knew her purpose. Not to preach, not to sing, prophesy, or travel the world. She was not a Joyce Meyer, but she was a Christ-like nurse. Is it possible whatever God's called you to be, uh, that even in an hourly wage job somewhere that you work around other people that they say, you know, there's something different about him or her. And then you are fulfilling your purpose. Here we have the story of Joseph. Talk about a purpose. God is looking for a man that first of all is intelligent. I'm sorry, he was. Well respected in his community. And someone that, write it down, could hear the voice of God. Had he not been able to hear God's voice speak to him, tell him that he's to take Mary to be his wife, because this is of the Holy Ghost. Think about it. Talk about a man with purpose. He's got to go against all odds and all the uh, strange stares and looks of family members during this first Christmas, you heard about Mary, huh? And you ought to hear what Joseph says about it. Uh, something about the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I'm sure the Holy Ghost. And yet he was willing, watch now, because we're building a, a different look of Christmas that may look more like yours right now. And that is, first of all, there was family problems. And yet Joseph was going to obey the Lord. And so he wasn't going to put her, it said he considered it, and anyone would, the embarrassment. I'm a well-known architect. And yet people are going to say, yeah, but you've got an unfaithful wife. And then he said he considered putting her away privately. But nonetheless, he could hear God. Take notes. More importantly, he obeyed God. Against the difficulties it would present, he decided, I'm going to obey the Lord. Talk about a man of purpose. Where would we be today? And what would the story look like had the man God chose to be the stepfather of a virgin who was going to bear the Son of God, had he been someone that was more worried about his public reputation, about what that might do to his business, the pride and ego, even in the face of his own family and her family and the issues that would have brought up, it was more important to Joseph to obey the Lord. Or in other words, let's say it this way because we can make application. What made their first Christmas blessed was not because of the family being perfect. No division, no discussions, no gossiping, whispering, uh, posting things on Facebook about how awful your father, mother, daughter, son is, was, may be. Instead, what made their Christmas blessed was they still had Jesus. He was the center of everything they were living for. Doesn't matter what we go through. I am going to be your husband, Mary, and that boy I'm going to raise as my son. And trust what God spoke to me. Don't be afraid to take her. Now there's something else to consider. If you go to, and we're not going to take time, but if you were to go to Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, to Luke chapter 2, we find out a few more things about Joseph. Remember, we're looking at Christmas as we look at ours through the eyes of Joseph. 
a man of purpose. Another thing we find out is that during this time of year, a decree went forth that everyone was to be, and this is the King James wording in uh, Luke chapter 2, says the, the whole world known at that time controlled uh, by the Romans, everyone was to be taxed. Actually, it mentions that twice in Luke chapter 2, that the whole world was to be taxed. But I want you to, if you take notes, take another note, because this opens uh, the wide angle lens to Christmas a little better. And that is that word for taxed is actually in the original Greek, enrolled, to enroll, sign up. Because you see, taxes were always paid and there were tax collectors in wherever you lived. They would go door to door and keep records and make sure wherever you were, was your residence, that's where you paid your tax. So why was it that Mary and Joseph had to make this long, difficult journey while she's pregnant to Bethlehem? If you read carefully, Luke chapter 2 tells us and says, because that Joseph was of the lineage of David and that was his original family's hometown. That's where he was from. So watch now because you're going to see a parallel here to our Christmas. Joseph and Mary would have already paid their taxes, probably, and even more so. He was wealthy. But they would have paid him in Nazareth. Then why go all the way to Bethlehem? Because there was at that time a census. You had to return to your place of birth, enroll or sign up, tell them where you live now, so they could, watch now, keep track of you. Does that sound familiar? In other words, they were living under socialism. The government wanted to know where they were, what they were doing, so they could get their money, keep control, keep an eye on them. And so here now we have Joseph, watch now, he's had to leave his hometown, difficulty with family and friends trying to explain this odd situation with his wife, make somehow this journey to where she doesn't miscarry, and go to Bethlehem. Now when they get to Bethlehem, if you read on in the story, the parts that we don't often think about is it actually gets worse. Oh, I know, and thank God for the angels showing up and, and the baby born in a manger. But listen to what happens next. When the wise men come, when the wise men come, one of the things they tell Joseph is, we're not going back where we came from because they're trying to kill Jesus. This evil king is looking for this uh, savior of Israel that's supposed to be born, so let's just kill them all. And so they decide to move on. More on that Wednesday night when we get inside the manger. But also Joseph had another dream. And the angel of the Lord appears to him, and this time he tells Joseph, he says, Joseph, I don't want you going back to Nazareth. But listen now. Don't go back to Nazareth. Once you've signed up for the census, he said, because of danger, I want you to go, listen, I want you to go to Egypt. And Joseph obeys the Lord. Instead of taking Mary back home, he takes the baby and his wife to Egypt. Now that's significant because if you understand the cultures of that day, for Joseph to go to Egypt, and he doesn't know how long he's going to be there. He's just obeying the Lord. How long will that go on? Because, watch now, that means he's got to leave his business in Nazareth. Or like many during this pandemic, it means he lost his job to obey the Lord. Can't go back to Nazareth. I've already got family problems that are talking about what's going on with my wife and I. We've made this long journey. The baby's born, and now we're supposed to go to Egypt? Did you know that also in Egypt, if you were not from Egypt, to maintain control over their uh, economy, as well as probably some prejudice, that the Jewish people could not get a work visa, we would call it today, in Egypt? Did you hear that? Meaning, not only Joseph's not going back home to his well-paid job, 
Not only does he have family problems during his holiday season, not only has he made this long journey, now God tells him, and you can't go back home. You've got to leave your job and now go to Egypt where they're not going to allow you to work. I just want to ask you a question. Does that sound, perhaps in a few different details, but does that sound similar to what often this time of year can be for many of you? Family problems, issues, embarrassing things that you know others are talking about perhaps, but uh, somehow you're coming together the best you can as families, get through this season, their losses. But then also like Joseph, there's so much sometimes that we have to give up and just trust God with. That's all Joseph did. He could hear from God. If there was ever a time, my friends, that we need to be able to hear from God is now. Yes, I've heard the prophets and I want to believe uh, that we're going to have a righteous government, that we'll see abortion finally cease and God's Bible values brought back to our land. But listen, did you ever think about the fact that Joseph and Mary lived under that same kind of pressure. Think about it. They were under a suppressive or an oppressive government, literally looking to kill Jesus just like they are now. Actually, I saw a sign, grieve my heart, one of these protests. It said, if Jesus comes back, we'll kill him again. That's what we're facing. No matter who goes in the White House, there's darkness covering our land. And yet Joseph was obedient to the Lord. So let's kind of wrap this picture up before we continue next Wednesday night on this, uh, what it would look like to be a man of purpose as Joseph, who didn't have to have a pulpit ministry, but God found a man that, as Scripture says, was just. He was intelligent, well accepted in society, good business, an incredible husband that was willing to uh, bear his wife's shame and even now to obey the Lord and leave everything he's built, go to Egypt. But you know, God always takes care of his people. When you obey him, he will bless you. Because you see, financially, Joseph was fine. Mary had nothing to worry about and Jesus was going to have a good upbringing because God saw to it that before the angel of the Lord tells them to go to Egypt, he sends three wise men and they bring gold, frankincense, valuable, myrrh, valuable, or in other words, the resources to be able to go to Egypt and have a honeymoon with all expenses paid while they begin to look at adore and appreciate a savior that had been born. Is this the center of your Christmas? Because if you're going through depression, there are those you love that you miss. There are those you love that are still with you, but with great problems. No doubt about it, this is going to be a different Christmas. This is going to be a time where unless Christ is the center of your holiday, then there'll be nothing holy about it. But you can be blessed because Jesus is with you. I want to pray for you. And just ask, Father, that those who are facing this time of the year that has often been in times past a time of joy, a time when family by Many numbers could get together without restrictions and fears. But this year is going to be different, a little different. But Father, I pray that the greatest difference will be that they will make you the center of this time of year. And most of all, Father, I ask for those who've not ever felt like they had a purpose. That Father, like the man who thought his whole ministry was just feeding the homeless on one night, and didn't realize that everything he did in life was to be done for the Lord. Father, help us to see our real purpose. To be good fathers and good mothers and whatever our occupation and skill God has given us, use that for the glory of God. And then we can be a people of purpose. God bless you.